Are the days in Genesis real days? Did God create everything in the universe in stages over millions of years? Stay tuned to find the answers. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live, the program that gives Christians the kind of faith-building information found in Creation Magazine. I'm Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. Today we're going to discuss a topic that, is, that, that might rile a whole bunch of people up because it's very popular. <laughs> right. Uh, well, we're used to that anyway. But, well, uh, progressive creation, that's our topic on Creation Magazine right. Live today. So what, what is that? What's progressive creation all about? Well, uh, it's the concept that, uh, you know, God didn't use the days. The days in Genesis aren't real days. They're, they're periods of time, um, millions of billions of years. They're undefined, basically, and that's how you're going to uh, fit the, the concept of millions of years into your So God your created in, in six stages, uh, created some animals, they went extinct, then he created others, they went extinct. So it looks like evolution, but it's not. Right. Um, and again, these are people that are trying to uh, honor God. They're, they're, they're Christians. They believe Scripture uh, you know, is the authority and that uh, you know, they're, they're what we'd call evangelical Christians, but they're still trying to um, put in what they've maybe learned in school about yes, astronomy and biology and geology and these kind of things, these vast ages, and, and make them fit with right. the Bible. Another compromise method. Yeah. So progressive creationists, they don't believe in evolution uh, per se, but uh, they believe that with God creating different kinds of animals at different stages, it looks like evolution, but that's well, what they're kind of getting at, isn't it? I, I don't know. When they say they're not evolutionists, see, evolution has four components. There's astronomy, the Big Bang, the, the idea that the, Earth, you know, the universe is billions of years old. Okay. There's geological evolution, the idea that it took Earth you know, millions of years to really you know, form the way it did, or billions, 4.6 billion years old. Right. Then there's biological evolution, um, and then there's chemical evolution, life from non-life, and then you know, onward, up, upward. Uh, evolution. So they say they're not evolutionists, but I kind of call them 50% evolutionists because they believe in about 50% of what um, evolutionists believe in as right. far as time okay. scale and things like that. So today we're going to look at these concepts and others back in a few minutes. If God created a perfect world, where do diseases come from? In the beginning, God made everything very good. But since the fall of man, the entire universe has been degenerating. Many disease-causing agents are the result of degeneration in organisms and mutations, while others are the result of substances not doing what they would have in the world before sin. Viruses, for instance, could have had a pre-fall role in transferring genetic information to maintain genetic diversity. For more information, there's a chapter in the Creation Answers book that deals with this intriguing question. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. www.creationontheweb.org has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource the creation evolution issue. There are more than 5,000 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and the evidence for a global flood, the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, and many, many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. One of the main reasons that CMI built this website is to strengthen the faith of Christians. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creationontheweb.org provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. For years, 
Perhaps one popular evidence for a recent creation was to argue that the amount of dust on the moon must have accumulated in less than 10,000 years. The claim was based on early estimates of the rate at which dust from space accumulates on the moon's surface. If the moon really is billions of years old, there was concern that the Apollo moon landers would sink into a deep layer of dust. However, these early estimates were wrong, and by the time of the Apollo landings, NASA was not worried about sinking spacecraft. The new data makes this argument for a young moon invalid. For details, visit the Arguments Creationists Shouldn't Use section at creationontheweb.org. Welcome back. So let's let's define progressive creationism. Okay. What are we talking about here? Progressive creationists don't accept evolution. We've said that already in biological the, in biological evolution in the, in the classic sense. They, that is, they deny transformism, like one so, kind of creature turning into something else, that right? Lizard into right. a bird or something like that. Uh, but they accept the same basic philosophical approach. That is, uh, uniformitarianism, the materialistic billions of years and so on. Uh, they accept that over scripture. And, and we'll point that out uh, as we go on here in, in today's program. Right. This means that they must try to fit the billions of years into Scripture. Which is, so it, it's another one of these, these compromise ideas mm -hmm. uh, um, to try to fit the millions of years into Scripture. Right. And uh, they're, they're talking about a local flood, about pre-Adamite soulless creatures that, uh, that uh, you know, built it, made instruments and buried their dead and, and that kind of thing, but they weren't human because they didn't have souls. Mm -hmm. the, all these kinds of ideas are wrapped up in progressive creationism. So once again, they've looked at the fossil record and they've accepted the fact that um, you know, th this geological record proves vast ages, so on and so forth, and also astronomy. They is accept a big dating uh, methods, the, da the same dating methods that the secularists uh, right. believe. Now, I guess the key claim for a progressive creationist is that the universe is billions of years old. That this is just fact. We, we've got the science to prove it now. They've, they've, this is what they assert many, many, many times. You know, it, it's just irrefutable. We've got to accept billions of years I, I, with our theology. Right. And as we've said many, many times, that scientists do not measure the age. Right. We don't have anything that measures age. We measure certain rates happening at certain, producing a certain amount of material. And we measure that material right. and we assume the rates and so on and we assume the initial conditions. But we don't have any way of, it's an interpretation. Right. That's the bottom line. So if, if, if uh, for progressive creationists, as they, they see the, the, the dead things basically in the fossil record, they're saying, well, see, God created these types of creatures and then they died out and went extinct. Then he created these types of creatures, then they died out and went extinct. So it kind of does look like evolution. That's, uh, the evolutionists right. would say, well, this thing transformed into this thing. And the progressive creationists say, no, no, they didn't transform. They just went extinct God and then there was another. created them, right, the right. different ones. So let's take a look at this, um, you know, because really it comes down to which authority do you accept? Do you, do you accept scripture as authority or do you accept interpretations of science uh, about millions of years and so on you and know, so forth. The whole creation evolution issue boils down to biblical authority. Exactly. Are you willing to put science beneath the Bible? Right. And, and look at the Bible, read it plainly, don't reinterpret the Bible with science, then you're putting science above the Bible. Right. So that, this issue is really at the, at the foundation of the whole origins debate. Exactly. Um, I'll just uh, put up a couple of quotes here. Um, the first one is from Hugh Ross. Uh, this is his book, The Fingerprint of God, page 178. Okay, so Hugh Ross is, is probably the most famous uh, pro progressive creationist. Uh, proclaimer of, of this notion of progressive creation. That's right, he's a Christian, um, but he holds fast to the idea of billions of years and, and so on and so forth. And in his, uh, in his book, he says, If the time since the creation of the universe were scaled down to a single year, the whole of human history would be less than one minute. So he's saying there's this huge, vast age that we, we just have to accept out here and that humans have been around for a very, very, very short period of time. But the creation took place over billions and billions of years. Yeah, it seems odd, doesn't it, See, seeing as how man is the king of creation? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and most of creation has been around without any people. Right, but let's, let's take a look at a different creationist here. The creator, Jesus Christ, in Mark 10, verse 6, he said, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. He's talking about from the, the beginning of, of creation, not the end of creation, as as Dr. Ross and, and other progressive creationists would right. say, man didn't appear until 
very close to the end. That's right. I mean, you know, if, if you really take a look at um, these two quotes, you can see um, what authority uh, is being accepted here. Jesus Christ, um, God as man, accepted the authority of Scripture. Christ is referring to Genesis. The book of Genesis is saying, you know, from the beginning of the creation, God made the male and female. As a matter of fact, when he starts this quote, he says, um, have you not read? What is he talking about? He's talking about the reading Old the Testament. scripture, the Old Testament, Genesis, r being written as history, and it's, but, but from the beginning. So we don't have billions of years here. The Bible doesn't actually say there's billions of years. But if you accept secular scientific interpretations, that's, that's what we believe is happening right. with, with uh, these progressive creationists. So really, well, that's what we've got to look into. Does the Bible actually allow for millions of years? Can you look at what Scripture says? Can you look at the Hebrew? Does it allow millions and millions right. of years? We hinted at this a little bit on, on the program, on, on last episode's program. Right. Um, there are all kinds of Hebrew words that could have been used in Genesis chapter 1 to denote a long period of time. Right. Let, let's take a look at some of them. Uh, we'll put up a chart here. There are several uh, of these words, uh, for example, Kedem, which it's a term for ancient. Olam, everlasting or eternity. Dor, a, a revolution of time or an age. Uh, Tamit, continually or forever. Ad, unlimited time or forever. Orek, length of days. Uh, Shana, a year or a revolution of time. Netzach, forever. Eth, a general term for time. Or Moed, seasons or festivals. So you can see that there's a list of words here um, that could have been used to, to say, God could have said, yeah, there's, there's millions of years or these days aren't real days or anything like that. But that's not what he, he chose to, to right. say. Um, I can give you a, uh, a couple of examples. If God had wanted to say, um, you know, advance of, of time or, or anything like that. Um, and... Uh, so, so let's take a look at that. Events of a long time ago. If God had wanted to tell us that his creation took place in a long time in the past, he could have used yamim, a plural of yom, alone or with evening and morning, and it would have meant, and it was days of evening and morning. He could, he could have used that kind of phrase structure, and then it would, okay. could have given you a different meaning. Okay, but we've got that Hebrew word yom, the yom, Y-O-M in our alphabet. Right. Uh, yom in, in Hebrew. Uh, and, and, and it's a it word can, for day. It can have a number of different meanings, but it could also have, as you just, say, uh, as you just showed there, it could have been changed to indicate right. many days. Because yom with evening and morning always means a literal day. But he could have used yamim, and that would have given the, the, the conveyed right. you know, a long so, time. So, so the real point is, what is the context around the word yom, Hebrew, right. uh, for, for day, in Genesis 1? Exactly. Now, that would have been, using that word, yamim, would have been the simplest way for, for God to have signified um, you know, many days and the possibility of vast ages, but he, he didn't use that, but that's a one that he could have. Um, right. The word uh, kedem by itself, or with days, would have meant, and it was from days of old. So there's a, a word that could have been used to, to indicate you know, long periods of time and stuff like that. But again, that's not what, what is used. We're just showing that God could have used these terms um, and, and, and done that. Uh, the word olam with days would have also meant, uh, and it was from days of old. So there's lots of terminology that God could have used if he'd wanted to indicate that these were vast right, periods so, of time. So there was Hebrew available at the, you know, Hebrew available right. to indicate more than a day. Right. So let's take a look at this word day. Um, here, here's a way, it was really a little poem I made up. Right? Yeah, <laughs> but we're talking context, right? the context of the word day. Right. So we can see the different meanings of the word day here. In my father's day, it took three days to drive to Florida, driving only during the day. From right. southern Ontario here where we're located, we can drive to Florida in about three days or less if you drive faster. But yeah. in, in these three examples of days, we can clearly, this is English obviously, not mm -hmm. Hebrew, but we can clearly pick out the meaning of day uh, based on its context. In this first example here, in my father's day, right. is that a literal day? No. Obviously not. Easy to understand. Right. Easy. You don't need to. You don't need to be a, a, an English linguistic expert. And, and what to, you're showing here is we're doing it in English because that's what our viewers are, are, are viewing, are understanding. But also, what you, I don't know Hebrew. So. Well, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> but we're just showing that it's context that's right. important. The, the, the semantic range of the word day in English, that the range of meanings that it can have, is approximately the same of the range of meanings right. that the word yom can have in the Hebrew. In the second example here, it took three days. Are those literal days? Yes. Right. 
easy to understand from the context. What about this last one? To drive to Florida, driving only during the day. What does it mean there? Well, it means the daily Daylight. portion yep. of one Earth rotation. Easy to understand. Mm -hmm. So now if we go to Genesis, or first if we look outside of Genesis 1, the uses of the word day outside of Genesis 1. Day plus a number, 410 times outside of Genesis 1, always means an ordinary day. Right. Evening and morning, 38 times outside of Genesis 1, always means an ordinary day. Evening or morning, 23 times outside of Genesis 1, always means an ordinary day. And night with the word day, always means an ordinary day outside of Genesis 1. Right. Now let's look at Genesis 1. So here we've got the, the rules from Scripture, or right. the, the guidelines from Scripture. Let's look at Genesis 1. Night, evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. So I'm getting a strong it's all hint there. there that this is an ordinary day. Can you marry your relative? According to the Bible, all people on earth go back to Noah's family and before that, back to Adam and Eve. Since we all are ultimately the descendants of the same parents, all people are related. You have to marry your relative. If you don't, you marry something that isn't human. Of course today, we don't marry our close relatives for legal and biological reasons. We marry someone further away in relation to us. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. www.creationontheweb.org has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue. There are more than 5,000 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and the evidence for a global flood, the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, and many, many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. One of the main reasons that CMI built this website is to strengthen the faith of Christians. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creationontheweb.org provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb. Org. Just before the break, we were talking about the meaning of the word day right. in Genesis 1. And if we look at Genesis 1, you see the context around the word day there in Genesis 1. It can mean nothing other than an ordinary day, right. one earth rotation. Uh, it's it's a, absolutely crystal clear in Genesis 1 that it's a literal day. The word day can have many other meanings but not in Genesis 1. In context, it has to mean a literal And bit. some people say, well, what about 2 Peter 3, verse 8, where it says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And we've heard this many times at seminars and so on That's and so right. forth. One day could be as, lo as long as a thousand years. That doesn't help anyways, by the way, because you only get 6,000 years. <laughs> in Gen you need millions of years. If you're going to satisfy that the geologists. Help. Yeah. And then if you're going to use this verse, to modify the meaning of a Hebrew word in Genesis, right. then well, why not use other verses to do the same thing? Like in Psalm 90, verse 4, it says a day, they compare a day to a watch in the night. Well, the Jews had three watches during the night, about four hours each. The Romans had watches that were slightly different. So now is a day four, four hours? hours? Right. You, you, I mean, you can't do that. Mm. And if you look at the rest of the verse in 2 Peter 2, it says, and a thousand years is as one day. So which one is it? Right. Is one day as a thousand years, or is a thousand years as, as, as a day? Right. What this verse is talking about is God's patience in the for the future judgment. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's outside of time. It right. has nothing to do with the days of creation. Right. So as a matter of fact, um, you know, it's interesting that people will, will look at these verses and try to modify, but again, you can see that they're taking outside influences and trying to make it fit their theory 
it's not a and plain And you try reading. to get biblical text to try to fit with that, but when you, when you really look at them, it doesn't. Right. Another question is, the word day is used over 2,300 times in the Old Testament. Why question only Genesis? Right. I mean, if, if you, for example, I don't know if you've never very likely been to a Bible study, for example, on Jonah, right. where they're questioning the meaning of the word day in the book of Jonah. <laughs> right. You know, was it, uh, was it three days that, that Jonah was in the great fish? I mean, maybe right. a day's like a thousand years and Jonah was in the great fish for 3,000 years. Right, or maybe it was I three mean, unspecified three periods <laughs> of time. Um, <laughs> Again, you, you see the bias coming from outside of Scripture saying, well, we've got to jam millions of years in. You're right. It's not right. consistent. Or Joshua on Jericho. You know, was it seven days that the Israelites marched around Jericho? Or was it, could it, could it have been longer than that? Right, we, right. we only question Genesis when it comes to that. Yeah. Now, what about this notion of day six, there wasn't enough time. Adam couldn't have possibly have named all the animals because there wasn't enough time on day six and there was too many animals. Right. Well, it's interesting, you know, this um, argument, because again, what, we're trying, what they're trying to say, or, and many progressive creationists are trying to say, is the days couldn't possibly be normal days. Um, Adam had too many things to do. You know, he, right. he, he had to be created, and, and then Eve had to be created, <clears throat> and uh, the animals had to be named. There's just too much time, and see, these are just allegory type days. They can't days. be real days. Right. But you know, these are the same arguments that skeptics are using to tell people that the Bible can't be true. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. So, so people who, who they're, they're Christians, they, they're, they have a Christian ministry and so right. on, and they use the arguments that skeptics are using against Genesis. Right, it, it, to mean that you can't trust any of Scripture because if one part isn't correct. So, well, let, let's take a look at that because I've actually had people say that to me. Um, you know, well, he couldn't have done this. Um, number one, why did Adam have to name the animals anyway? Well, God had given him authority over, over the earth, and, and so this was a way that God could, or uh, Adam could, could actually exercise that authority, and uh, it also showed him that he didn't have a mate, right? That there was no suitable right. mate, and, and that God was going to create uh, create one for him. Um, so really, we need to look at okay, how much time are we talking about here? Evening, morning, day. You've got about twelve hours of daylight, so Adam's got twelve hours to perform uh, all his duties that day. Okay. Yeah. So um, you know, if, if you look at it, um, he had to name the animals. Well, if you look at Scripture. Genesis chapter 1 says that the animals were created according to their kinds. So we need to understand what a kind is to be even be able to understand his task. Right, and which kinds of animals to get a number for how many animals would Adam have had to name anyway? Right, because the, the argument is, well, there's millions of animals in the world. If he had to even right. take five seconds, it would take too much time, et cetera, et cetera. But um, we need to understand that, you know, uh, when we look at today, we look at dogs, let's say. There are many different dog variations. Right? But they've all come about through natural selection, which is not evolution, by the way, and you can uh, see previous shows on uh, when right. we talk about that. So the fact is that uh, in the beginning, God would have created a dog or wolf-like kind and with, would have had all the genetic information for all the variants, and you can use natural selection or, or unnatural selection of breeding or anything like that and create variants. But the amount of animals that, uh, that Adam would have had to name would be a lot smaller. He didn't have to name chihuahuas and poodles and so right, on and so and forth. compared to what we see today. Right, yeah. so it's the kinds. Now, um, in Genesis 2.20, um, it specifically describes what he needs to name. Uh, they were the cattle, the fowl of the air, and every beast of the field. So Adam wasn't required to, to name sea creatures, and he wasn't required to name creeping things. and. Uh, and, and so when, when you look at it, all of a sudden, oh, well, maybe this isn't as daunting a task as, as is set up by skeptics and, and, and people trying to say it's a different, not a real date. The term cattle, uh, behemoth, um, usually refers to, in the Hebrew here, as animals which lend themselves to domestication, okay? So um, what we might call domestic fauna. So um, most of our cattle today can be traced back to a creature called an oryx which is a, actually, I looked it up in the American uh, Heritage Dictionary. Oh, very good. And it said, an extinct wild ox of Europe, northern Africa, and in western Asia believed to be the ancestor of domestic cattle. So this auric, you could you know, use natural selection or breeding, and you could create all these different types of cattle that we see today. Okay. But really, we're talking about maybe a few dozen kinds at most. So if you only got a, maybe 24 of these these. Um, these different kind of cattle that he would have had to name. Okay, so that's the first issue. A lot fewer kinds initially. Right. So how many, how, do we have a ballpark figure for how many that would have been? Uh, yeah, well, it mostly would have been a, a few dozen kinds of cattle that we, we, we think he would have had to, to name. And then there's the fowl of the air. Now again, 
Um, the Bible mentions about 50, 50 different birds. But when we're talking about kinds and how many birds he would have had to name, you know, there's uh, 285 species in the pigeon family today. Right. Right. So again, you've got this variation. Well, it, it, it's a pigeon. When you actually do the math, um, he probably only had maybe 200 different birds. Uh, for example, parrots and things like that. You can get many different looking uh, parrots, but again, right. he would have had about 200 there. And then you've got the beasts of the field. Well, that's not the beasts of the earth. That's a subset of the, of, of the entire beasts of the earth. They're the beasts of the field. So even if you allow for extinct types, um, you know, you're probably looking in the low hundreds here uh, of actual different types of, of creatures. Now, again, not, not different variations, but the different types right. of the beasts of the field. So was he equal to the task? Well, um, there's about 3,600 seconds in an hour. So even if he had a thousand creatures to, uh, to name, which we don't think he would have had that many, um, he could have completed the task in under an hour. If he did it at a more leisurely pace, you know, contemplated what he was going to name them and stuff like that, he could have done it in a couple hours. And this would have left plenty of time for uh, God to create Eve and, 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 and all so the other on activities so on day six. That's right. So here's, an, here's another example <laughs> where uh, the skeptics and also uh, progressive creationists in this case have, uh, have said it couldn't be a real day because of all the activities, but when you look at, you, you look at what happened back there in Genesis 6 or what was required, it fits. That's right. It fits with what the Bible plainly says. A day is a real day. Uh, for example, I've had, I remember uh, speaking one time at a conference and there was another speaker came in and we started talking and, and this person was an, a Christian apologetics uh, expert or, or I guess we could say that. And again, we started talking and all of a sudden I, I sensed some tension and we started talking about the age of the earth and, and oh, she was okay. willing to, to allow for millions of years and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, she used this argument, you know, that the days in Genesis couldn't be literal because the sun wasn't created until the fourth day. And then how could you have a real day without the sun? And so maybe it was just an allegory or, you know, maybe, maybe the order wasn't really that important. And, and I found this very, very interesting because right. here's, a, here's a Christian, committed Christian, believing in the scriptures, believing in the authority of the scripture. And, and yet she was using an argument against me and said, well, you, you know, this can't be as plainly as God has written. Now, again, those are, those are types of arguments that skeptics are using. And I had to, uh, to uh, remind her, um, the Bible clearly says that God created light, but the sun became the, the light bearer on the fourth day. And uh, if you look in Revelation, right, it says that there's going to be no need for a sun. No right. need for a moon. I said, have you read those scriptures? And, and, and she said, oh, yeah, I never really thought about that. I mean, we're not told what the light source was in Genesis 1, but there was evening, there was morning the first day. The first four days are the same as the last three. Right. The text in Genesis says they're real days. Exactly. So, again, you can't really change what the scriptures actually say. Many people have seen a depiction of Noah's Ark that looks like a big cartoon boat with animals bulging from its hull and giraffes sticking out of the top. Depicted like that, it seems more like a fairy tale than a real historical event. According to the description in Genesis 6, the Ark measured around 450 feet long, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high, so its volume was about one and a half million cubic feet. This is the equivalent volume of over 500 railroad stock cars, each of which can hold 240 sheep. Calculations suggest that the average size of the animals on the ark was about the size of a sheep and that 16,000 or less were needed to repopulate the species after the flood. The ark was well designed for its intended purpose. Refuting Compromise with his usual brilliant clarity, Jonathan Sarfati, author of the best-selling Refuting Evolution, Volumes 1 and 2, has produced a comprehensive and resounding refutation of the position of progressive creationist Hugh Ross, whose views are causing massive confusion about science and the Bible. This is the most powerful and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis creation ever written. Does the idea of millions of years really matter to the church? What are the actual beliefs of the various interpretations of Genesis? And what are the consequences both inside and outside of the church? 
But those that have viewed these as side issues, this book will provide eye-opening insight into the serious theological and cultural implications of the Long Age view. So in the news, uh, we always like to take a, a portion of the show and just talk about some of the things that uh, people are talking about that relate to the creation evolution uh, controversy and issue and What's things hot that hot uh, in the news. Uh, CMI covers a lot a lot of times. Um, came across this article, found it very interesting, and uh, I think it will illustrate a point that we make over and over again. It was entitled "Oops, Huge Distant Galaxy Turns Out to Be Small and Nearby." Now that that was an, I, that caught my my attention right away. <laughs> It says, uh, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it says astronomers are rubbing their eyes after discovering that a galaxy assumed to have been a giant for the last 23 years is in fact a dwarf, according to new observations. And you, you keep reading and it says, new data obtained with the 3.6-M ESO telescope. I have no idea what that is, but I take it it's a new and improved telescope from what they were using the before. Astronomers listening might, uh, might they'll, recognize they'll that. They'll know what that is revealed that the two galaxies have very different redshifts and are not at the same distance as once believed. Okay? Since the universe is about 14 billion years old, um, observing this star will give us a small glimpse of the universe as it was just yesterday, at more than 95% of its current age. So even the age they, they feel now is different because of the position that they yeah, believe it's in. Of course, that's a major part of this article. There it is again. Right. Millions, millions of years. Of years. Millions Boom. of years. It's just stated yeah. as fact since the universe. Uh, our new observation with the telescope thus confirm a new member of the nearby Centaurus A group, which true identity remained hidden because of coordinate confusion and wrong distance estimates in the literature for the past 23 years. Now, what, what, what does this really tell us? Science isn't an exact science. Science. <laughs> yeah, okay. It so, tells me that the title's funny. I just, I love the title. Oops. Yeah, yeah huge uh, distance <laughs> galaxy turns out to be small and nearby. I mean, you know what? Our, we have a full full staff of people that are PhD scientists, right? And, and I mean, are they always right about what they're observing and things like that? No, you know, I, we, we admit I that. Mean, that's, that's how science works. I mean, I'm right. kind of laughing at the title, but yeah. that is how science works. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. It, here, new data has, has given a different conclusion. Right. In this case, different means, I'm, this, is, this is a 180. Well, like, it's, it's, it's pretty it's, different. It's, yes. it's about yeah. as different as you can <laughs> get. But the point being, and we make this many, many times, is if you start marrying your the theology to these scientific concepts, there we go, yeah. You can have a severe challenge because if you start schmoozing with the, the scripture, oh, well, you know, we can accept this and we can accept that, and maybe this means this, and, and you start imposing views upon scripture that are not plainly there because of scientific interpretations. What happens when, when you get a report like this? Science changes, right. If science changes, now what do you do? Do you, do you back out and, and let's say even people you've been witnessing to, what are you going to do then? Oh, well, uh, now we know that that's not what the Bible means. I mean, that can have a severe impact on people because right. you know, people who aren't Christians are, are looking to Christians and saying, hey, do you really believe what you believe? Or, and why do you believe it? I mean, and, right. and we try to keep up on that kind of things. We, we've got a section on our website called Arguments That Creationists Shouldn't Use. Right. Arguments Not to Use. Mm -hmm. And that's on our website to try to, to try to show people that science moves on, we learn new things. Some of the arguments that used to be in support of a young Earth or a young sun or a young moon or a young, yep. young processes, we've learned more. Mm -hmm. And those arguments are now out of date and creationists should not be using them anymore. Right, right. So we've got that section on our website. Yeah. Here's another article. Uh, this is from uh, Thursday, February 22nd, 2007. Killer chimps make spears and hunt bush babies. <laughs> uh, so, he, so here's chimps making spears. You can already, I mean, you can see where you this know is what going. they're going to say. Yeah, right? yeah. <clears throat> Chimpanzees are capable of making spears to hunt other primates and have been using, using the weapons to apparently kill bush babies for meat, scientists announced today. Right. Uh, the article says a little bit later on, this has, an important this has important implications for how we think about evolution or the evolution of tool use in our own species. Right. So again, they're saying, we evolved from apes. Look, these apes are using tools. Look how similar they are to us. Right. And this is going to tell us how we evolved. Right. Uh, it's going to tell us how we evolved. Uh, the article goes on, we have tended to emphasize the role of adult males in hunting, and this research supports that the assertion 
that we should not ignore females, that, that we should not ignore the females and other individuals. Earlier this month, scientists reported that chimpanzees used stone tools as early as 4,300 years ago, suggesting that they learned to make and use these tools on their own rather than copying humans. So, interesting. Yeah. I was flabbergasted, said one of the scientists here in the article. <laughs> right, the chimps routinely broke off branches, trimmed them with twigs, leaves, and bark, and sharpened the tips of their spears with their teeth. Right. So this is, these are excerpts from this article. Yeah. Now, we, we actually had an article on our website. Uh, in in response to this, in, one in of our scientists to responded to it. And, and I mean, okay, let's, let's look at what they're trying to say. We evolved from apes, we know that, that's what they're saying, and these apes are using tools. Uh, we believe that the first ape men used tools and then they progressively got smarter and more sophisticated and so this supports the theory of evolution. So they're trying to make a linkage from us between to, to these apes. Right. Now the whole link is tool usage. Tool usage, right. Now we pointed out in, in the article that we had on the website that we're rebutting this that things like, you know, animals like the woodpecker finch, you know, the woodpecker finch, a bird of the Galapagos, will, will, will snap off trigs, twigs, trim it to size, and then we'll use that to pry insects out of bark. Are, are, you know, little insects are inside the bark. So they'll actually take little twigs or, or, or spines or thorns, snap them off, go in and, and, and poke things out, and, and they'll use these okay, tools. Okay, so there's birds using tools right. in some cases. Right. Well, we didn't evolve from birds. We, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's the whole point. They're, in this article, they're trying to say, well, see, apes are using tools, and they're sharpening them. And, well, it's I don't, evidence for human evolution from apes. Right, and I don't think there's a bird but, human going to evolve real soon. As a matter of fact, this is an interesting one. Carrion Crows says the scene, a traffic light crossing. On a university campus in Japan, carrion crows and humans line up patiently waiting for the traffic to halt. So picture this. The, the birds lights line up with the people? With the people. Really? When the lights change, the birds hop in front of the cars and place walnuts which they picked up from the adjoining trees on the road. After the lights turn green again, the birds fly away and the vehicles drive over the nuts, cracking them open. Finally, when it's time to cross again, the crows join the pedestrians and pick up their meal. So these crows know, okay, we've got these nuts, we want them cracked open. They wait, they put the things out there, they scoot out of the way, cars drive over them. When the, all clear is there, they go and they pick up these nuts. And, and the, they, it was pointed out that if the car doesn't drive over them, they'll go out and reposition them. Oh. Oh, really? <laughs> and wait for the cars to do their job. So here we've got sophisticated, um, you know, uh, ideas going on with these crows. Obviously, they're using our tools to, but, to crack their but nuts. But humans didn't evolve from crows, did we? That's, yes. see, so that's the thing. So again, it, it sounds good in the news. We, we see these things over and over again. Evolution's been proved. We know it's true, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at the actual facts, um, it doesn't really support they're being quite selective in the reporting aren't they right in our in our article we mention these other things that are, are quite advanced in animals but they're not mentioned in the evolutionary media that's right belief in evolution has prompted a search for missing links to bolster the idea that man has evolved from ape-like creatures this has led to some colossal scientific errors, one of which was Nebraska man. Evidence found in 1922 was proclaimed to belong to the first man-like ape of America. The Illustrated London News printed a picture of the ape man, showing the shape of his body, head, nose, ears, the amount of hair he had, his wife, domestic animals, and tools. And what was the evidence for the illustration? A single tooth. And not just any tooth, but the tooth of a pig. Does the Bible really say that there was never a global flood? Is the Big Bang compatible with the creation account in Genesis? And was there really millions of years of death and bloodshed on planet Earth prior to Adam sinning and the fall of man? According to the startling claims of progressive creationism's most visible proponent, Dr. Hugh Ross, the answers are yes. In the book Creation and Time, authors Mark Van Bieber and Paul Taylor bring careful and accurate biblical study to bear on each of these claims, revealing numerous errors in theology and misuse of Hebrew in Dr. Ross's teachings. This exhaustively researched book on the theological ramifications of progressive creationism and its scientific inaccuracies is a wake-up call to all Christians concerned about biblical inerrancy and the terrible divisiveness that erroneous theological beliefs can cause. 
Written in an easy to understand format where more than 40 claims of progressive creationists are dealt with separately, each claim is described followed by a detailed rebuttal showing the error in either theology, science, or both. This is a must-have book for anyone dealing with progressive creation theories in their church or personal lives, or for anyone who wants to compare arguments for an old earth to what the Bible and science say about the age of the earth. Well, we're back, and we're talking about progressive creationism. Right. And uh, one of the, the key points that progressive creationists um, like to make sometimes is that they say that the, the church fathers um, really believe that millions of years was, uh, you know, was accepted and that, uh, that, that theologians um, have accepted the idea of millions of years for a long time. We make the claim that if you actually look at the literature, that's not true at whatsoever. Right. There, there have been key, um, key Christians in the past that, that claimed that the uh, days may not have been literal days, but they were actually arguing the other way. They'd accepted some of the, the Greek philosophy of the time and said, well, these days are just, you know, allegory and, and stuff like that. But they were actually arguing that God created in a day or in an instant. In an instant. They, they were working the other way. Rather than six days. Today we've got the other, the other problem <laughs> right. going on. So here's, here's Martin Luther. The days of creation were ordinary days in length. We must understand that these were actual days contrary to the opinion of the Holy Fathers. Whenever we observe that the opinions of the fathers disagree with scripture, we reverently bear with them and acknowledge them to be our elders. Nevertheless, we do not depart from the authority of scripture for their sake. Now, this is Martin Luther. This is the He's guy. He's a bit of a said, rebel. So. Let, let's get back. But, but, but what was his main point? Let's get back to what scripture actually the says. Of scripture. The authority of scripture. Uh, not look outside of that. What he else can, we got? He continues with this one here. When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. So that was, you mentioned that already. That right. was what the theologians or some theologians were saying in his time. Right. God created everything in one day. And I really like this next part. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. I mean, amen. You know, yeah. you know, the, the, what we're talking about here is the Word of God. Right. The Word of one who knows everything about everything. He was there at mm -hmm. the time of creation. We were not. Neither were any scientists. And so if you don't understand it, that doesn't really matter. God's word says what it says. That's right. Ultimately, the Holy, the Holy Spirit is the author anyway right. Of, right. Of, of the Bible. John Calvin, similar comment. Albeit the duration of the world, now declining to its ultimate end, has not yet attained 6,000 years. So he believed in a young world. God's work was completed, completed not in a moment, but in six days. Right. John Calvin, again, a great church father, right. great reformer. So, I mean, we could take the time to list out, uh, you know, you know, tens of tens of tens of, of uh, you know, uh, theologians in the past who, who believed in a, um, a literal six-day creation and so on, and we could point out the very few that, uh, that tried to go outside of those things. But, I mean, with uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin, we could probably say we've, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> yes, and there's, I mean, that's a summary of what the others are getting at as well. Right, right. Now, um, you know, I think one of the most important things to, to understand in this, this um, topic is that um, people who don't believe in the Bible, people um, you know, that are skeptical of the Christian faith, they can see compromise when, um, when it's right. presented to them. That's right. I, I As you could in, in your, before you became a Christian. I sure could. And, and uh, I just got a quote here um, from, from someone who is, is an atheist, uh, David Hull. And he's uh, written in Nature magazine, The God of the Galapagos. And he says, he's, he's talking about life itself. It, the process is, is rife with happenstance, contingency, incredible waste, death, pain, and horror. He says, the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history. Millions of years. Millions of years. Right. Is not a loving God who cares about his productions. He's careless, indifferent, almost diabolical. He's certainly not the God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. See, he's made a key point. We said that progressive creationists don't believe in one type of creature changing into another, but they still accept the fossil record as the history of life on Earth, which is the history of death on Earth. It really is. Yeah, and well, the fossil record, a record of dead things. Right, so the data of natural history is a record of death. If that happened before sin entered, 
all those things are God's fault. We're back to the same problem with, with God declaring that very good at the, at, at the completion of day six, if it was already in existence at that time, and the destruction of the gospel right. doctrines. So many progressive creationists have kind of painted this picture that, you know, young earth creationists, you're on about the age of the earth, and this is a side issue, and, you know, really it's not important, and, and, and they've kind of used this, and, and many evangelicals have been won over to this way of thinking, that, you know, it, it's just important that God created, not when. Right. And, and here's a, a quote uh, from, again, uh, Dr. Hugh Ross in his book, Creation and Time. And uh, he says, the battle line has been drawn over a peripheral point, the age of the universe and our earth. And he says, misidentifying the timing of God's past works in the cosmos has little or no bearing on that relationship. And he's talking about the relationship to God, we right. have with God. He says, nor does it bear on the Bible's authority. It appears ill-advised then to make an issue out of such a trivial point. Now, this quote um, we're showing, you know, to me it identifies some key uh, problems here. Um, he, he, he's saying that this is a peripheral point. Well, um, uh, for example, he has a, a, a website that he uh, runs, and he has a whole entire Christian ministry where he talks about progressive creation, and he, he believes that, that that's the way uh, God created. So it, it doesn't seem logical that he believes it's a peripheral point because he argues this point quite a bit, actually. Yes. Um, and then he says that the timing has, has little relationship to the authority of God or a relationship to him. But we keep making this point. For skeptics, the number one question we get, that, uh, and, and even many Christians will say, if you've got a loving God, a God of love, why is there so much death, right. pain, disease? Why did Where my aunt, who's a really nice person, why did she die of cancer? Why did my, my dog get run over in a, by a car? I mean, all these things. If God used millions of years to create, then he is the creator of death, and that's not what Scripture says. And the atheists, the non-Bible believers, they can see that. They can and see it just, immediately. Just amazing that a lot of Christians can't make that connection. So, so how can the w number one comment from skeptics, where did death come from, and is it God's fault, how can that be a trivial um, issue? because it relates so much to the sequence of the creative events and the age of the earth. That's right. Now, uh, you've got a quote from, uh, from, from someone who, a, a Christian that's identified this challenge? Yes, Chuck Colson and Nancy Piercy in the book, How Now Shall We Live? Uh, they write, God is good and the original creation was good. And right. they reference Genesis 1 verse 31, actually says very good. Mm -hmm. God is not the author of evil. This evil? is a crucial element of Christian teaching there would also be no basis for fighting against injustice and oppression, mm -hmm. against cruelty and corruption, for these two would be reflections of God's own nature and therefore inherent in the world as he created it. Right. Well, see, that makes total sense to me. What's interesting, and you and I both know this, is that Chuck Colson believes in millions of years. Right. So he, he hasn't seen the logical connection, apparently, because he's right. If, if fighting and oppression and, and, and cruelty and all those kinds of things if that's reflected in God's nature, why fight against it? But if you believe in millions of years of these animals and people... Of, and of fighting and cruelty and animals ripping each other up and all the rest of it in the fossil record... I guess we just better get used to it because that's the way God created. But, you know, th it's not true. You know, many times I've had people believing in progressive creation say, well, we're just talking about human death here. We're not talking about animal death. But the scripture right. doesn't back that up. Genesis 129 and 30 says, Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that is fruit with seed in it. They'll be yours for food. But then later on, it says... Um, it's the very next verse. Yeah, uh, to all the beasts of, of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground. Everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. He's not just talking about people. He's talking about animals. Everybody ate plants. Right. Which means if you're all eating plants, there's no carnivorous activity, there's no bloodshed until after man sins. That's a hint of what the original very good world looked like. Right. Now, progressive creationists have also said, well, yeah, but plants die. Right. They right. die, it's so that's death argument. before sin. So that, 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 you know, they're saying, no, no, God did use death. But plants don't die in the same sense that animals or people do. I mean, that. That, to me, that's common sense, but um, here's a quote from, uh, from Dr. Ross, and he says, Even plants suffer when they're eaten. They experience bleeding, bruising, scarring, and death. Why is the suffering of plants acceptable and not of animals? Well, I, I haven't heard a carrot you know, scream out in pain when I bit into it. Uh, that seems common sense to me. But if, if you actually go to the Hebrew, there's a term called the nefesh, or, or life spirit, that's applied to 
animals and man that are that's never referred to in scripture. Yes, the life is in the blood. Leviticus says, and we right. have an idea of what those those uh, that nefesh quality of life life was like, right. and it doesn't include plants. So that's plants right. dying before the curse wasn't a problem. Right, they're just a biological machine. So despite what many people think. The main issue for our ministry is not the length of, of the days or millions of years or all that kind of stuff. Really what it comes down to is the authority of Scripture. And if you accept the millions of years, then you've got God as the author of death. Death isn't the last enemy that's revealed in Scripture. God used that and it was good. And that's, that's right. totally contrary. There's so much more that we could talk about, uh, about progressive, progressive creation. We've got to do another episode on this, uh, on this topic. According to the Bible, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel and then Cain went somewhere and found a wife. Where did she come from? Genesis 3 verse 20 says that Eve was the mother of all living. And Genesis 5 verse 4 says that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters, so Cain would have married one of his sisters. But this answer raises other questions. The law against close intermarriage did not come until the time of Moses. Biological problems in their children were also not a problem at that time since the genetic mutations that cause problems increase over time. In the beginning God created the genes with no mutations. For more details go to creationontheweb.com and search on Cain's wife. Finding answers to questions about the origins debate. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creationontheweb.org. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 5,000 articles, many of which appeared in leading creation's publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation over more than 30 years. A new daily front page article keeps web visitors informed about the latest breaking news in the creation evolution debate. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creationontheweb.org for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend the website features a feedback article, a response to web visitors email feedback. Often the anti-creationist arguments in skeptics' emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way, believers can see that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, can be defended against skeptics' arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials, all available to build up the faith of the believer. Got questions? Get answers at Creation on the Web. Dot org. Okay, welcome to the feedback section of the show. Uh, what we've got a couple of articles that we'd like to talk about today. Again, feedback is is uh, uh, emails mostly that we get from folks who visited the website. Uh, we've got one here called "Commended," or we've titled it "Commended for Aiming for Accuracy." Our, our ministry tries to aim mm. for accuracy as much as possible. We've got a peer review system among all right. the speakers. Our talks are reviewed and so on by the scientific staff and the other speakers mm -hmm. to make sure that they're accurate, both biblically and theologically. Right. Here's what one person wrote about that. I have seen that your organization has received some heat concerning the published article uh, on our website, Arguments That Creationists Shouldn't Use. And I've read that article and I wanted to say that CMI was right to publish it. I note that some critics assert that the article seems to be single out specific creationists who insist on teaching disproved scientifically invalid theories. However, with respect, such objections from critics are irrelevant. Basic, basic sense suggests that if certain people are presenting untruths, mm. then they are the ones who need to lift their game and stop doing it. No rocket science, it's as simple as that, this, this person writes. The article isn't at fault, it's accurate and truthful. What the article does is to state that what science and hypotheses have been, what science and hypotheses have been discredited over time. Mm -hmm. And that's all it does. Right. If some people feel the heat of the spotlight as a result of coming, th the truth coming out of this article, that isn't CMI's fault, nor is it their problem, right. <laughs> this person writes. 
If those telling untruths were to stop doing so, they would be in the clear. One has to wonder what their motivation is to persist in doing this. Misleading people is not how the great works of the Holy Spirit are achieved. Right. Or do the critics seriously propose that untruths should continue to be taught in creationist circles mm. in the name of unity and peace at all costs? Right. Uh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> he continues, the fact, that, th the fact is that all truth is on our side, uh, he writes. We have more than, than enough real scientific evidence available to us right now to make a convincing case for special creation and a literal genesis to a person with an honest mind. To tell people anything less is to undermine our own position, and we have no biblical mandate to mislead people to the truth. Another interesting point. Yep. Indeed, such a proposition is manifestly absurd, this person writes. Yep. So we're... This is what we're trying to do, but, but in the process of saying this is accurate, this is not, some people who are using those inaccuracies, right. they, they, uh, they feel that we're attacking them. But, but as this person has, uh, has clearly seen, right. that's not what we're doing. We don't want anyone to show up at a, at a, at a meeting, a, a skeptic or a non-Christian, and to be exposed to, to an idea that has been discredited, and then say, well, I'm going to you know, then take the rest of the message and, and, and not you know, not hold that as accurate either. We're trying to give people solid um, truths that they can, they can right. really hang And they with. can take these to knowledgeable right. evolutionists and they're not going to get shot down. Right. That's the idea. And, and I think that sometimes when people uh, that have been critical of us taking that stance, really what they're, they're caught up in is evidentialism. Well, see, so you took away my evidence. And we're, we're, we try to tell people, you know, hold fast to the scripture, but the, the methods of, uh, of how God did those things, we weren't there. Our, our young earth models, scientific models, and so on, they right. will change over time. Because the evolutionist models change too. That's right. Leads to another feedback we got. Um, we had an article, uh, it was called Hugh Ross Lays Down the Gauntlet, and it was done by Do Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. And in it, um, Dr. Uh, Ross was, was um, saying on, on his website that um, you know there were some problems with the young earth creationist uh, stance and so on and so forth and so uh, Dr. Sarfati wrote uh, a, a, an article um, kind of re refuting some of the things that Dr. Ross had said. Right. Now uh, we got some feedback came back and it was negative and basically the tone was well you know you're, you're being unchristian you're being unkind to refute another Christian's uh, things. Um, one of the, the, the points here was your tone is offensive and personal. Well, you know, we, we try never to be offensive and personal, but when you're refuting a specific person's teachings, um, sometimes it may be misconstrued as being offensive and personal right. to that or, person. Or person uh, personal, uh, what we try to do is attack the teachings right. if they're incorrect, not the person. Right. So I'd just like to say, if anybody's watching this episode and you've seen any of the quotes we've used, we're not attacking those people personally. They're, they're brothers in Christ. Um, you know, and, and that's right. And, and we we've quoted it. from some from some wonderful Christian gentlemen in the past. Yes, yeah. we just don't believe that um, this is a biblical stance, and we actually believe that this will cause problems with people coming to the knowledge of Christ because um, they can see the inconsistencies of some of the teachings that we believe are, are being espoused. Right. So um, you know, the apostles often uh, rebuke um, rebuke. Uh, false teachers, and they also even rebuked one another. Paul rebuked uh, that's Peter. Right. That's right, partially, <laughs> to his face, in public. Right. And so Peter made public statements, and, and that, that's what happens as well. People make statements on their website in public, and we, we refute them in public on our website. That's right. That's, that's all part of how, uh, you know, how these things work themselves out. That's right. And here we are in a public light also. <laughs> so uh, maybe if you want to give us some feedback, uh, you should write in. That's right.